I usually start with a really big introduction. I am not today because the text is so, well, powerful. Uh, I don't think it needs an introduction because uh, Paul is going to talk about in this passage how a believer uh, uh, secures victory uh, in life because he's spent the last two chapters, six and seven, uh, uh, defending himself uh, with Jewish believers who were accusing him of, of, of being light on the law because he was so much about the grace of God. Uh, and so he spent two chapters in six and seven explaining to Jewish Christians that he's not anti-law, therefore antinomian or lawless, uh, because he's now more lawful because he's actually related to the Messiah. Therefore, he really wants to please God. Uh, and so it's the opposite position is true. But as we talked about uh, last week in our study, uh, the problem was not with the law, the Torah. The problem was with sin. Paul says, I, I love the law of God. Uh, it came from God. How could I not love it? But he said, my problem is the law tells me what sin is, and I'm a sinner who does sin by definition. But once you get saved and you have this position of justification in God's courtroom by faith, how do you then match your positional walk, your sanctification, with your hype position? That's the goal of maturity is to match those two. Paul's going to talk about that struggle in the passage, and here's the premise he's going to develop uh, in verses 14 to 25, which is... Uh, if you are paying attention, this might be your premise. How can a person, speaking of a Christian, gain victory over power, the powerful presence of inherited sin? Because you inherited sin from Adam. Now, positionally, God forgave you of that sinful situation in his courtroom, but now you have the opportunity to live to the glory of God and get sanctified as you learn to discipline yourself and yield to the Spirit of God uh, to match your daily walk with your high, holy position. That's your goal. That is the Christian walk. But you've got a problem. The problem is you're still in a fleshly body with fleshly desires and sin. And so how do you gain victory? So Paul's going to talk about victory in this passage. Uh, and we want to read the passage first in case you don't know. It's a very familiar passage. Uh, and I can remember back in high school when uh, one of my uh, uh, dad's friends, uh, he was my Sunday school teacher. He was on uh, uh, Peleliu as a Marine um, I think he was on Iwo Jima as well when Nick sat down when I was in high school and took us through Romans 7 as young students. I thought to myself back then, this is a picture of my life. Uh, here's what we learned that day in Sunday school. It says uh, Paul speaking to the Jews. He says, for we know, we Jews, we know the law, the Torah, and we know that it is spiritual. Why? Because it came from God. Anything that would come from God by definition would be spiritual because God is spiritual. Uh, but he says, the problem is, on the other side of the equation, I am of the flesh, sold into the bondage of sin. For what I am doing, present tense, like participle, uh, I do not understand, for I'm practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing that I hate. There's a paradox in my life, he says. But if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, I agree with the law, the Torah, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Sin's the problem. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. He's honest about himself, which we should be. That is in my flesh. What's he see? Well, for the willing is present in me to follow God, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I would want to do, I do not, but I practice the very evil that I don't want to do. But if I am doing the very thing that I don't want, and I am no longer the one doing it, what's the problem? Well, but sin which dwells in me is the problem. It says, I find then there's a principle of evil that is present in me, the, the one who wants to do good. It says, for I joyfully concur with the law of, of God on the inner man. I love God. I want to follow God. But then what happens in a practical life? I, but I see in a different law in the members of my body waging war, present tense, continually, uh, waging war against the law of my mind that wants to follow God, uh, making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. He cries out finally in his frustration of the paradox of fighting sin and evil. What's he say? Oh, wretched man that I am. And then he doesn't say who, he, sa he doesn't say what, he says who. He says who will set me free from the, this body of death, thanatos, death. Uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is where the preposition is most important. Which preposition? The word through tells you the means by which you get deliverance. We'll come back to that in about an hour and a half. Stay with me. Um, <laughs> that's just a Marty joke. It's Marty humor. Um, so then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. I want to serve God. On the other side of the equation, he said, I figured out I got another problem. My problem is my flesh, and it causes me to follow the law of sin. I have this paradox. After I read that again this week, and I've read it many times, 
I, I, I just said to myself, I can relate. Can you relate? Because if you can't relate to what I'm talking about, then you probably don't know God. Because if you know God, you understand your sin. And the, you only have one other option. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you, you could be a believer who's a carnal Christian, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3, and, and, and you've sought after your sin so often that you've silenced the voice of the Spirit of God because you've become calloused. But you probably, you know, are one of those two. But if you are struggling with your sin, you know what I'm talking about. And I don't know about you, but one of my prayers for my life this week has been, God, help me to be as sensitive toward the sin in my own life that Paul had. Wow, was he sensitive to his sin. It's easy to be sensitive to the sin in everybody else seated around you. They have such an issue, you know, et cetera. You know what I'm saying? God, help me see myself. Anyway, that's this extra. Let's get on with the sermon. How do you find victory? Uh, victory starts uh, first uh, over sin uh, with understanding the positions of the passage. In fact, this is the key to interpretation of the entire passage. I can argue both positions effectively, uh, but I think one is tenuous and one is not. One is, uh, uh, has better evidence for it, and I'll show that to you. But of the two views of the passage, uh, when did this occur in Paul's life? So view number one is uh, Paul is a non-Christian here, a Pharisee, who's struggling with the Torah and obeying the Torah. He wants to obey it, and he doesn't obey it, then he does obey it, and he's constantly struggling, and he finally screams out at the end of the passage, who's going to deliver me as a Pharisee from the, in, my inability to fulfill the Torah? Missioch, Jesus, and he gets saved. That's view one. View two, uh, it's the normal Christian life. It's the battle between the world, the flesh, and the devil, and the spirit, your spirit, the God that dwells within you, your, your desire to follow God. It's a normal Christian life. Uh, which view do I take? I take view two, although I completely understand the argument for verse one, uh, view one. But here's the reason why I believe uh, view, view two is the view. Because you can't get to the application of the passage unless you understand when is Paul speaking this way? Was he saved or, uh, or unsaved? I think he was saved. And I'll give you three reasons why. Number one, um, he uses the present tense. I would think if he was speaking about his old life as a Christian, it was like, well, I remember when I used to be a non-Christian. I used to do X. No, he's saying this is what I perpetually do. This is, this is the struggle I face. This is why it's in present tense with participles that are in the present tense, etc. He's, he's speaking about, this is what I struggle with now. I know the Torah and the law, because I'm a Christian who understands the value of the law, because God is of the law. But I struggle with obeying the law because I still have a fleshly body with desires that are evil. Uh, so that's my first reason for believing uh, why the passage speaks of Paul as a believer, too. Um, he speaks about a frustrating battle with sin. Which just leads to a simple question. Do non-Christians struggle with sin and trying to please God? No. That is not what they're thinking about. We know that as we peruse the, the book, because we've studied this book in detail for almost a year now, have we not? Isn't it amazing how far we've come? Uh, let's go back and just peruse through the passages to understand how this could not be a non-Christian in this passage. Go back to chapter 1, verse 18. What does Paul say there? He says that the ungodly person, the person that rejects God, knows the truth of the Trinity of God. He knows there's a God. He just argues against the reason of that evidence, and he suppresses it. He holds it down, and then he worships anything and everything other than the living God. That's his life. So if he's in science, he's, he worships scientism. If he's into, well, you pick it. He suppresses truth. He doesn't care about walking with God. He's walking against God. So therefore, I don't think chapter 7, the struggle with uh, sin and holiness, is the, is the picture of Paul as a zealous Pharisee. Uh, chapter 1, verses 19 to 31, tells you that the unbeliever readily chooses worshiping anything other than God. He's not interested in God's law, but his law. He is his law. That's not what you find in chapter 7, verse 22, where Paul uh, cries out in verse 22, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. A non-Christian person doesn't delight in God's law. Why? He ipso facto loves his law. He's narcissistic. He's the standard of measurement. Uh, three, we're still on point two. With me? Three people are with me. Excellent. Uh, and actually, uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 28, uh, Paul tells us that when you reject God's truth multiple times, God gives you a depraved mind. 
That your really, it's the concept of searing something. Like when you when you, who has not done this? You, the, how do I iron? Everything's on totally hot. I'm a guy. Just everything is blazing hot. I've set. Well, I had a really nice pair of pants that were like parachute material. Blazing hot. I loved those pants until the day I ironed them. I set the iron right down on the front front part of the pants. I still wear the pants. You can see them when I'm wearing them. Total V pattern of the iron burned in there. Fried it. See, that's what happens to the conscience of the non-Christian person. Fried. Depraved. So why would there be a struggle if your conscience is fried? Uh, Well, it wouldn't. So therefore, that's not Paul's... He's not talking about a non-Christian in the passage at hand. Uh, In chapter uh, 1, verse 32... Uh, speaking about uh, the non-believer, uh, it says that he approves of those who sin. Boy, isn't that our culture? The more sinful things you do, the more pr- they all get together, and it's hug and howdy time. They love each other. You don't find them in chapter 1, verse 32, struggling with people who are doing sinful things. They agree that they like what they're doing that's evil. Uh, chapter, um, let's see, chapter 3, verses 1 to 20. Uh, go back and read those 20 verses with your small group sometime today. Because uh, Paul talks about how the non-Christian, by definition, runs to sin. He loves sin. There is no picture of the, of the non-Christian struggling with, wow, I just need to follow God more. They don't do that. I didn't do that when I wasn't a Christian. Therefore, I don't think a Christian is in view, or a non-Christian is in view. And then, uh, really, uh, this whole passage dovetails with what Paul said in chapter 6. Uh, where he talks this way in chapter 6, verse 12, where he says, if you're a Christian, you're free from the bondage of sin at the moment of faith. God frees you. He's your new owner now. You serve Christ. But that doesn't mean you still can't sin. That's why Paul says in 6, verse 12, do not let sin reign in your mortal body as a Christian so that you obey its evil desires, its lusts, which means you can obey the evil desires of your body. It is a struggle. So based on those things, I think that's a reason why Paul is a believer struggling with sin not a non-Christian. And then my third point is, why in the world would a a non-Christian ever scream out, oh, wretched sinner that I am. I don't follow God hard enough. They would never scream that. Therefore, who's in view in the passage? Paul a zealot, non-Christian, struggling with, I can't obey the Torah enough? No. No, he's saying, I'm a Christian. I struggle with the fact that my life doesn't match up to God's holiness as much as I would like it to. Victory starts with understanding who's, who's struggling here because this struggle is your struggle if you're a Christian. Point two, victory starts with understanding the problem of the passage. What's the problem? Uh, the problem is there's God's law and what God calls you to do and there's your free will and flesh that have other desires that are contrary to that. And you struggle with them the minute your feet hit the carpet in the morning until you go to bed at night. I mean, haven't you ever walked away from a really good sermon? Like every Sunday? <laughs> you guys are terrible. Uh, you walk away and you just think, oh man, I'm so convicted. I know exactly what I need to know. Yes, Spirit, I totally uh, submit to you. I yield to you. Do, you. do you really fix it? Like what said issue is? Well, you might for a little while. And the next thing you know, you're back doing the same whatever it was again. I mean, you can fill in the blank. And I wrote down lots of illustrations. You can read my, my thoughts. But, you know, next thing you know, you're back to the sin that easily besets you. It, again, and you're like, what in the world? I didn't even make it past lunch. <laughs> my mom's here uh, looking for uh, a place to live, uh, to move here, uh, which is exciting. She's lived in California all of her life. Uh, and so she flew out here for a month to look at properties. And so uh, it's exciting. And to have your mom there to verify every story, it's going to be interesting. But um, she doesn't want to tie, she's been in her house, she's owned it for like 40 years. She doesn't want to tie all her money up in a property here, and she can't believe how much it costs to live here either. She thought California was expensive. Um, But um, so we've been looking at apartments, which is interesting, and she's found some really nice ones uh, in our area. And so the very first apartment we pulled into, massive complex, we pull in tons of parking spots, and they all have numbers. What's that mean? Someone lives there. Can you park there? Yeah, yeah, you're not supposed to. But there's nobody there. So we pull in with the real estate agent to get in the key. We pull in. She pulls in. I pull in next to her. And we no sooner pull in than some retired lady pulls in right behind her Mercedes. Just, I mean, instantly. And the parking lot's almost empty. She pulls in. Beep, 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 beep. Beep, 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 beep. 
what in the world is her problem? And, and so we didn't move because we're trying to get the key box to get in and you know, all that stuff. She keeps laying on her horn in her SUV. Your non-Christian side wants to do what? <laughs> it could be a church member. Oh, it's, oh, it's Marty. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm like, what is her problem? And so our friend finally pulls forward, and then the lady pulls in her spot. 132 is mine. Well, obviously. You know, and so, I, she's, so I'm parked next to my friend. She pulls forward. So I pulled around so I can roll my window down and talk to that lady. <laughs> Isn't that what Christians do? <laughs> rolled my window down. Hey, hallelujah, what's going on? Uh, rolled, I rolled my window down, and uh, she rolled her window down slowly. You know, you know. I, uh, I said, hey, are there, are there visitors parking spaces around here somewhere? Yeah, you would know that if you were paying attention. I'm like, whoa. Obviously, they don't go to our church. I mean, we don't talk like that. She said, it's clearly evident when you come down that road there where the visitor's parking is. I don't know, I'm a pretty educated guy. I didn't see a visitor's parking. It's, it's there. You just need to move your car. You need to park it over there, buddy. And I'm like, are you kidding me? And, and she goes, yeah, you need to park over there. That's visitors over there. It's clearly marked. I went, so I drove over there. Never saw a visitor sign. Never. Never. I was tempted in my flesh <laughs> to go over to that lady and go, could we have a conversation? There's no visitor signs, etc. But I was focused more on her sin. What was her sin? Her, <laughs> her sin. She was rude. Rude. Have you ever met anybody like that? Hopefully that lady's not visiting this morning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Is that you? Are you rude? I'm like, why do you have to be rude? I mean, what about the fruits of the spirit? Obviously, she needs to go to church. But, but you see what I mean? Say, say she was a Christian. I mean, she lost it right there in the car, didn't she? Have you, haven't you ever done that? You walk out of a church service, you go, I, I totally know, I got to stop being rude, I'm totally convicted, I got it, and you get out, and in the parking lot, you're honking at somebody. <laughs> eh, eh, eh. And then it's like, oh, I didn't even get out of the parking lot. What did Paul say? Victory starts when you understand the problem of the passage. What's the problem of the passage? Your flesh is the problem. Are you with me? Verse 14. He says, for we know as Jews that the law is spiritual, and, but I'm of the flesh sold into the bondage of sin. I can't get away from me. You know? And then he gets real. Verse 15, which we just read. We'll read it again because it's so important to understand it. He said, let me explain the struggle. For what I am doing, being rude, uh, I do not understand. Why did I do that? Why was I rude again? Uh, but I'm not practicing what I would like to do, not being rude, being nice. But I'm doing the very thing that I hate, being rude. But, but if I do the very thing that I do not want to do, being rude, uh, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good, because the law says, thou shalt not be rude. <laughs> it's a little stretch, but you get it. So, <laughs> so now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, because I've seen myself in action, that is in, in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, not to be rude, but the doing of the good is not, you know, for, for the good that I want to do, being nice and pleasant, I do, I do not do. I'm rude. But I practice the very evil that I don't want. I'm rude. But if I'm doing the very thing that I do not want, being rude, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. What in the world? I need help. See, and you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, my problems are not rude. He's got issues. It was an illustration. There's many other things to pick from. Uh, can you relate to that? You know, the struggle. So I, the other day, I was watching a movie. Uh, I like to watch movies, and I watch this movie, and as I'm watching it, I'm going, whoa, major theological impact for my life. It was the movie Venom. <laughs> Just saying. Have you seen it? How many have seen it? Confess now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's, it's kind of an edgy movie, and uh, it's uh, not PG. I mean, it's, it's, it's a... It's sci-fi. I love sci-fi. But uh, are, are you going to watch it? This is going to be a spoiler alert. You can't stop me anyway. So here's the, mo the movie. <laughs> the movie is about this journalist. His, his name is uh, Eddie Brock, kind of a rough, 
voice, New York kind of mentality, kind of just like him right off the get-go. Uh, and he, he wants to get the scoop and the story on uh, the Life Foundation and shut down Carlton Drake, this rich, evil scientist who uh, has found alien life forms and wants to bring them into his uh, uh, lab and merge them with human bodies to make the ultimate human. Really good idea, huh? <laughs> so he breaks in there, commits willful sin right from the get-go, breaks in, gets into a lab with an alien being. The alien then jumps on him like a glob, merges with him, and then he exits said place with superhuman abilities. He can morph into this. Do we even show you the picture? We've got to see the picture. Now, now I know, it's kind of scary. Um, Venom is who's taken over him, and Venom is evil, ugly, powerful, and so all of a sudden, Eddie can't stop himself from doing things like taking on SWAT officers and stuff. I mean, he gets violent and angry and I'm watching this going, this is my sermon, <laughs> but this is your life because isn't sin in your life kind of like venom? It's like, I, I, I didn't want to be rude. And next thing you know, my hand's on the horn. Don't tell me movies don't teach theology if you're paying attention. Because Ellie was, uh, uh, Ellie, <laughs> Eddie was taken over by Venom. Very interesting. You know, Lord, I, I wanted to get control of that, but I did it again. I, I can't believe I did it again. You know, how do you get victory? Well you, well, you understand that you have a problem. The problem is your flesh. Well, like what? In case you need ideas, Galatians 5, Paul tells you what they are. The Venom. What's he say? Well, now the deeds of the flesh... And you're all in it, flush your body until you see Jesus, right? Well, let's, let's list them. Well, they are immorality, pornea, covers every kind of sexual sin lexically in the Greek language that you can imagine. What's our culture say? Well, we've redefined all those things so they're not sexual sin anymore. Nah, Paul says, no, they're, they're, they're sin. Immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, pharmakia, this is, I think, the word there in Greek, enmity, strife. Wherever I go, I create problems. I wipe out offices. Jealousy, I'm a jealous person. Outbursts of anger, I can't, you know, I go from honking on the horn to exiting the vehicle. You know, uh, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness. I can't control myself. I drink way too much. I'm not saying about myself, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Carousing, I love to party, party hard, uh, and the things like those. He said, those are the things of the flesh. Those are the things that if you're a Christian, you don't want to do these things anymore because they're contrary to God. But you still have a free will to choose them because you're in the flesh. Paul says uh, victory starts when you understand you have a problem. The problem is the flesh. And yielding to God. Verse 21. He says, I then, as I analyze my life, I find a principle of evil that's present in me, the one who wants to do good. The, the, I'm not free from my fleshly body. I still have those propensities. He says in verse um, 22, for I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body. This is a military term in the Greek language, waging war against the law of my mind. My mind tells me, thou shalt not be rude, but my will kicks in, and what happens? Next thing you know, man, I, I cannot believe what I'm doing. This is why Paul talks about this in, in Ephesians chapter 6, where he says, uh, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's wrestling present tense. You're wrestling against the world, the flesh, the devil, and your own fleshly desires uh, to live contrary to God. But God can give you victory as you yield to him, as we're going to see. Again, I ask you, got victory? Can you relate? Paul says, I want you to have victory. He said, I've been there. Victory starts in verse 24 uh, when you understand the power of the passage. The passage builds to a climax in verses 24 to 25. He has the, the primal scream of the, of the frustrated saint he screams out in despair, oh, wretched man that I am. And then he asks the question, who, not what, who will deliver me from the body of this death? Who's the who? Jesus. Jesus is the one. But you have to lean on Christ. You have to call him for backup. He says in verse 25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through, preposition, tells you the means by which you get victory. Uh, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then he says, let me summarize the passage. So on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, I serve the law of God. I want to follow hard after God. I'm like David. I love God. But on the other, I struggle with my flesh, this tension. But he says, one day I'm going to be delivered. I don't know how you feel about heaven. I'm looking forward to it. 
delivered from a body that has the constant struggle with sin. Whatever the sin is. It's a battle until you see Christ. But he does give you many victories. And you mature as you get victories. But you're not totally free until you see him face to face. Imagine having a mind that only ever thinks things that honor God. Having an attitude, actions, words that only ever. You're not a cutting person anymore. You're not a deceptive person anymore. You're not a liar anymore. You're not rude anymore. I mean, you have the mind of Christ. Imagine. He says, thanks be to God to Jesus Christ our Lord, he, he will deliver me one day. It's eschatological. It's the future. But Christ is there to deliver you in the present too when you call to him and say, God, I need some help. And maybe you haven't called out to him in a long time because you're prideful or you don't think you have a problem. You, you need to call out to him. When I was in high school uh, to stay in shape for baseball, I decided to go out for the wrestling team. You ever make mistakes in your life? So I did, and I went out for the wrestling team, and I had a lot of fun, and it taught me much about myself and my limitations. It also got me in the best shape I was ever in, and it was great. I loved uh, being on the wrestling team, but one day, they had drills, some I didn't like, but you couldn't argue with the coach. Uh, one day, we, we had this drill. So at the end of practice, two and a half hours after practice, I can't feel my grip, my legs are shot, can't feel my calves, I'm totally dead tired. The coach says, you can't go in, Marty, you can't go in until you, you know, this lightweight guy, wrestle the heavyweight. I'm like, are you kidding me? He's like twice my size. He goes, okay, I'm blowing the whistle and you guys are going for it. So the guy hit me like a freight train. Picked me up, put me in a fireman's carry, me, carry slammed me into the mat. I was like a rag doll. I'm like, pin me, dude. Bam! Hit the, <laughs> I, hit, I hit the mat. And he, just, he was just crushing me. He was, he was a big 200-something pound guy just crushing me. <laughs> it was like that. <laughs> yeah, that's a picture of the, the way I used to look on the backside. Uh, but... <laughs> It felt like that. And, you know, and so I don't, uh, back in the 70s, things were different. Uh, uh, your coach, my coach, uh, Coach Wimber, I think he was all-state Wyoming wrestling champ like in college. Stud of a guy. Uh, they could hit you in the 70s, your coach, uh, physically. Now there would be an ACU attorney with each guy, you know. But uh, so I'm pinned, and the coach walks over to me, uh, and he looks down at me in total disgust. And this is what he screams in my face as I'm totally pinned and I can't move. He screams in my face, Baker, bridge out of that. You know, bridge, bridge out of that. I'm, I'm barely breathing, let alone bridge. Bridge out of this. Are you kidding me? And, and, and uh, so he, he said, he screamed again, Baker, bridge out of that. And, and so I said, coach, I, I don't have any more strength to bridge out of this. I can't move. He goes, okay, I'm going to take my wrestling shoe and I'm going to kick you in the head until you get the gumption to get out of that. Didn't you remember the 70s? <laughs> so he takes his wrestling shoe. Bam, 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 bam. Starts kicking me in the head. And it got me really mad. <laughs> but there wasn't enough adrenaline to throw off the 250-pound guy. So I finally looked at the coach after him kicking my head over and over again. And I told the coach, you can kick me all day long. I cannot escape from this guy. He's like, whatever. And then he walked away from me. What has that got to do with my sermon? A lot. Because I learned from wrestling about myself, spiritually speaking. Because I've been pinned on the mat by my own sin before. Amen. And I've cried out to God, I'm stuck. I need backup. I had a whole bunch of friends sitting there watching me get creamed. Imagine if I could have looked at some of my friends and said, hey, I need a buddy. Will you be my buddy? Nail this guy. See, to me, that's Jesus. You just have to humble yourself and say, God, I'm losing on this one. I, I need to call you. Can you come help me? You think he's going to stand there and go, I oh, know a little longer. No, he's going he's to come. He's going to deal with heavyweight. He's going to free you. And then you can walk on to enjoying your life. Maybe you haven't called for backup lately. So I'm going to ask Darren to come. Darren's here. And Darren's going to play an old song. It's an, it's an old hymn. I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. I mean, I'd rather have Christ than riches untold. I'd rather have him. That's calling Christ. You'd rather have him than your sin. Uh, I would say today, if you're a Christian, today is the day to say, I've been pinned on the map for far too long. Today is the day to call for backup. Christ is the backup.